Welcome to the UC San Diego School of Medicine ultrasound series for medical student education. This is the first abdominal ultrasound module with a general focus on gastrointestinal anatomy and pathophysiology. In general, this module is intended to explore the anatomy and physiology of selected abdominal organs from an ultrasound perspective. Specifically, we will discuss the organs of the hepatobiliary system which include the liver and the gallbladder. We will also discuss the spleen, which, while not a gastrointestinal organ, can be scanned with a sonographer's approach similar to scanning the liver. Other abdominal structures and their ultrasound exams will be discussed in more detail in future modules. In this lecture, we will first discuss the general approach and preparation for performing the abdominal ultrasound exam. Next, we will review some very basic liver anatomy and physiology followed by an illustration of the liver ultrasound technique. We will then proceed to a demonstration of biliary ultrasound technique, followed by spleen ultrasound technique. Lastly, we will conclude our lecture with some examples of commonly encountered pathology. Recall that lower frequency transducers, such as the phase array and curvilinear probes, allow for high depth imaging. Therefore, these probes are ideal for imaging deeper structures, such as the abdominal organs. After selecting the correct transducer, as always, please ensure that the optimal settings are used during the scanning process. Remember, these controls can be adjusted throughout the scanning process, and fine-tuning during the scan will help the sonographer obtain ideal images. Prior to starting the exam, remember to always explain the procedure to the patient and answer any questions that they may have. For ideal scanning, the patient should be advised to fast overnight prior to the procedure. The ingestion of vitamins or fiber products may increase abdominal bloating, resulting in bowel gas that impedes the visualization of structures during the ultrasound exam. Chewing gum or the use of tobacco may result in increased air being swallowed prior to the exam. This may also result in a suboptimal scan. Of course, emergency ultrasound exams may need to be performed without such preparation. We will now discuss the sonographic evaluation of the liver. The liver is a complex organ which serves many different functions. As a digestive organ, the liver continuously produces bile to help emulsify lipids in food, thereby allowing for better absorption of fats. The liver also has numerous important metabolic functions, including the regulation of glucose stores, the synthesis of proteins combined with the breakdown of amino acids, various aspects of fat metabolism, effects on the immune system, the conjugation and excretion of bilirubin into bile, and the degradation and synthesis of many hormones. Lastly, the liver is also one of the major detoxification organs in our body. The liver breaks down toxins which are eventually conjugated and excreted in bile or urine. It is also highly involved in drug metabolism, facilitating the breakdown or modification of many medicinal products. Anatomically, the liver is comprised of four lobes, with the two major lobes that are easily visualized on ultrasound being the right lobe and the left lobe. These are divided by the falciform ligament. Note the gallbladder can be seen on the fossa just beneath the right lobe of the liver. When the liver is visualized from the posterior aspect, the quadrate and caudate lobes are also seen in this animation. Here again is an illustration of the liver and its anatomic relationship to the gallbladder, which rests in the fossa beneath the right lobe. Note how the branches of the intrahepatic bile ducts ultimately form the right and left hepatic ducts, which then join to form the common hepatic duct. Recall that the liver has a dual blood supply from the portal vein and hepatic artery. These vessels are also associated with branches of the bile duct system. Here is a brief review of the hepatic microcirculation. Note that the branches of the portal vein, hepatic artery, and hepatic bile ducts form the portal triad as shown. The portal triad is at the edge of the liver lobule. Once blood from the portal vein and hepatic artery travel through the sinusoids, it is then drained into the lobule's central vein. The liver is hence a very vascular organ that receives approximately 25 to 30 percent of the cardiac output. 
After blood drains from the liver lobule into the central vein, these smaller branches begin to join to form larger veins. Ultimately, the blood drains into larger hepatic vein branches, such as the right hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein, and the left hepatic vein. These vessels then transport the deoxygenated blood into the inferior vena cava as demonstrated. This eventually results in venous return of blood to the heart. The portal vein, in contrast, conducts blood from the GI tract and the spleen into the liver. The mesenteric and splenic veins join to form the portal confluence. We will later discuss how the hepatic and portal veins have different characteristics on ultrasound. Note the branches of the portal vein as demonstrated here. Lastly, the hepatic artery delivers oxygenated blood to the liver. Recall that the hepatic artery is a branch off the celiac trunk of the abdominal aorta. Overall, the liver has a complex network of vasculature as illustrated here. In addition to the gallbladder and the vasculature shown on the previous slides, one should also keep in mind other surrounding structures. Note the close anatomic relationship between the liver and the right kidney. The right kidney, despite being a retroperitoneal structure, lies just caudal and posterior to the right lobe of the liver. Additionally, the proximity of the stomach and duodenum to the liver are also noted. The inferior surface of the left lobe of the liver molds over the anterosuperior surface of the stomach. When performing a liver scan, the most useful approaches for probe positioning include the subcostal and intercostal approaches. In evaluating a particular aspect of the liver, the examiner may need to try both approaches before obtaining an ideal view. Ideally, the patient should lie supine on the examination table. The patient may be asked to take a deep breath and hold it for up to 30 seconds to obtain better views of the liver. If necessary, the patient may also be turned to the left lateral position. To perform the liver exam, a survey of the liver is done by scanning the organ in B mode. The survey should be performed from side to side and from superior margin to inferior margin as illustrated in the diagram. Please ensure that the liver is scanned in both the transverse and longitudinal planes. During the survey, pay close attention to the size, shape, and echogenicity of the liver. As illustrated previously, the liver contains a complex network of vasculature within. Recall from the introduction lecture that echogenicity of a structure can be described as anechoic, hypoechoic, hyperechoic, and isoechoic. The normal liver has a smooth, homogeneous echo texture as shown here. Note that the appearance of vasculature within the parenchyma can be easily visualized. The portal vein and its branches have walls which are bright or hyperechoic compared to the liver parenchyma. It is important to make this comparison and confirm that the echogenicity of the liver is normal. In contrast, branches of the hepatic veins have thin, smooth walls. The hepatic veins do not demonstrate the hyperechoic margin seen with the portal veins. To evaluate echogenicity, the liver may be compared to the walls of the portal vein as shown on the prior slide, or it can be compared to the renal cortex. The liver typically has an echogenicity that is equal to or minimally hyperechoic compared to the renal cortex. Normally, in the absence of artifact, the intrahepatic vessels are sharply visible and the posterior aspect of the liver is also well depicted. Here we can compare the normal appearing liver on the left panel with an example of a patient with fatty liver disease on the right panel. Note the increased echogenicity of the liver in comparison to the right renal cortex. Additionally, the fatty liver makes it difficult to clearly delineate the intrahepatic vessels. Now that the survey of the liver parenchyma is complete, we will begin by scanning the liver from lateral to medial as illustrated here.
We begin with the first view, which is a window of the right lobe of the liver and the right kidney. When performing the scan, this view is obtained by placing the probe at the mid-axillary line at about the 8th to 11th intercostal space. The probe is held longitudinally with the marker dot pointed cephalad. This results in a coronal cross-section of the right lobe. As mentioned previously, this view also allows for one to compare the echogenicity of the liver and the right kidney. The liver is typically the same echogenicity as the kidney or just slightly hyperechoic compared to the kidney. Additionally, this view allows for the visualization of a potential space in the perineum called Morrison's pouch. When a patient is in the supine position, the most dependent area in the upper peritoneum is Morrison's pouch. Therefore, if free fluid is present in the peritoneum, it is visualized in this space. We will demonstrate an example of this at the end of the lecture. The next view is a modification of the prior view. Here demonstrated is a view of the right liver lobe with the right hemidiaphragm. This view is obtained with simple manipulation of the probe, typically by sliding up one rib space from the hepatorenal view obtained previously. If the view is not easily obtained with simple manipulation of the probe, try to have the patient take a deep breath and hold as shown here. As you continue to scan the right lobe of the liver more medially, the porta hepatis and its contents are typically encountered next. The porta hepatis refers to the fissure of the liver which contains the entering portal vein, hepatic artery, and exiting common bile duct. Oftentimes the easiest structure to identify is the main portal vein. As always, despite holding the probe longitudinally, some manipulation of the probe may be necessary to obtain an ideal image. Also, the gallbladder is occasionally visualized in this view. This particular image of the main portal vein was obtained by the sonographer by rotating the probe 45 degrees from the sagittal view to an oblique view. The next view is shown here. While still holding the probe longitudinally and while continuing to scan more medially, the margin of the liver's right lobe is reached just before the left lobe begins. At this point, the inferior vena cava, or IVC, is typically visualized in its longitudinal axis. Note how the IVC becomes intrahepatic prior to crossing the diaphragm. Once the view in this clip is obtained, the probe may be rocked upward towards the diaphragm in an attempt to visualize the IVC crossing the diaphragm towards the right atrium. In this clip, the IVC is shown draining into the right atrium. Once the IVC is evaluated in the longitudinal view, the examiner may rotate the probe 90 degrees to visualize the IVC in the transverse view. This allows for visualization of the hepatic veins, which drain into the IVC. As mentioned earlier, the hepatic veins have smooth, thin walls. In contrast, the veins of the portal system have walls which demonstrate a thicker, bright, or hyperechoic appearance. A slightly more medial view that can be obtained near the IVC is a view of the caudate lobe. While not always easily visualized, this view is also obtained by holding the transducer in a longitudinal axis. Shown here is a longitudinal view of the liver's left lobe, which can be seen in the near field. The caudate lobe is seen in the midfield of view, and the caudate lobe lies superficial to the IVC. The longitudinal view shown here demonstrates the far edge of the left lobe of the liver, which lies near the epigastrium. Note the probe placement required to obtain such a view. The left lobe is noted in the near field. In the far field, a longitudinal view of the abdominal aorta is visualized as demonstrated. Also note that this particular video demonstrates the effect of bowel gas on image clarity, as some scatter of echoes is noted throughout the clip. Another important point to consider regarding evaluation of the liver architecture and parenchyma are the intrahepatic bile ducts. As mentioned, these tiny ducts eventually join to form the right and left hepatic ducts. The intrahepatic bile ducts are very small in diameter, 
and generally not seen on ultrasound unless there is a blockage impeding the flow of bile. Typically, these bile ducts are less than 2 millimeters in diameter. The final step of the liver evaluation is measuring its span. To measure the liver size, use a sagittal approach, holding the transducer longitudinally at the midclavicular line. Adjust the transducer position and angle to include the diaphragm and the inferior margin of the right lobe of the liver. Once an adequate view is obtained, the image can be frozen and an approximate measurement can be made, as shown. Hepatomegaly is generally considered to be greater than 15.5 centimeters in span length. However, it should be noted that this measurement is subjective and that there are other parameters that may be used to determine hepatomegaly. For example, extension of the right lobe of the liver beyond the lower pole of the right kidney suggests hepatomegaly as well. This is illustrated in the bottom images. We will now discuss the sonographic evaluation of the gallbladder and bile ducts. The gallbladder is a hollow organ located under the right lobe of the liver. While the liver produces up to approximately one liter of bile per day, most of it is normally stored in the gallbladder. Given the small volume capacity of the gallbladder, it stores bile by concentrating it up to 20 times the original volume. The gallbladder is anatomically divided into the fundus, body, and neck. The neck is the narrowest region and therefore is a common location for gallstones to become impacted when present. Shown here are the main bile ducts. Note the right and left hepatic ducts join to form the common hepatic duct. The cystic duct allows for bile to flow in both directions, to the gallbladder for storage and towards the common bile duct, or CBD. Ultimately, the common bile duct joins with the pancreatic duct to form the ampulla of vater, which regulates the flow of bile and pancreatic juices to the duodenum. Due to anatomic variation, the body and the fundus can vary considerably in position, as shown. However, the neck and the cystic duct are typically situated in the region of the main lobar fissure of the liver. This is an important anatomic consideration when performing ultrasound. Here we can see the labeled common bile duct and main portal vein as they course towards the liver. The contents of the main lobar fissure, indicated by the stars, form a bridge between the gallbladder and the main portal triad. In other words, the neck of the gallbladder points towards the portal vein and can be used as a guide to locate the portal vein when scanning. As mentioned previously, the ideal preparation for abdominal scanning is to have the patient fast at least six to eight hours prior to the exam to decrease bowel gas. Additionally, the gallbladder contracts after feeding and therefore it is more difficult to visualize on the ultrasound postprandially. Here is a sonographic demonstration of the same concept. Note that the contracted postprandial gallbladder on the right is more difficult to visualize. The transducer selection and patient positioning is similar to the liver exam discussed earlier. Once again, the supine position is preferred to begin the exam. However, the patient may be moved to the left lateral position to improve visualization of the gallbladder. The first step of the exam is to locate the gallbladder. There are several manners in which this may be accomplished. One of the most common approaches one can use to identify the gallbladder is the subcostal sweep. In this approach, the transducer is placed on the right medial edge of the costal margin. The examiner orients the probe longitudinally with the probe marker towards the patient's head and instructs the patient to take a deep breath. Sweep the probe inferiorly and laterally along the subcostal margin. The second approach is the X-7 method, which is an intercostal window. The X stands for the xiphoid process. Find the xiphoid process and move laterally to the right approximately 7 centimeters. Place the probe perpendicular to the skin between the ribs and the gallbladder may be visualized from this location. Using the mentioned approaches, once the gallbladder is identified, the next step is to stop sliding the probe and make small adjustments to create the best long axis view. As illustrated earlier, 
the long axis of the gallbladder will vary from patient to patient. In the long axis, the gallbladder is typically a pear-shaped hypoechoic structure with a hyperechoic wall. In this particular patient, the gallbladder has a long tubular appearance mimicking a blood vessel. However, there are several ways for the sonographer to ensure that it is the gallbladder. Note that the tubular structure appears to taper at one end. As discussed earlier, the gallbladder neck is closely associated with the main lobar fissure indicated here. This subsequently leads to the portal vein. Hence, the association of the tubular structure with the lobar fissure in the portal vein suggests that it is indeed the gallbladder. Another way to differentiate a tubular shaped gallbladder from a blood vessel is to use color flow. Note the absence of flow in the gallbladder. Two other common variants of a normal gallbladder include a septated gallbladder and a Phrygian cap. This latter variant is seen in 1-6% to of patients and occurs due to the fundus of the gallbladder folding onto the body. It has no pathologic significance. Be careful not to confuse folds or septations for gallstones. Once the long axis view is secured, please ensure to fan through the entire gallbladder by tilting the probe gently from side to side to evaluate for abnormalities. After the long axis view is evaluated, rotate the probe 90 degrees to obtain a short axis view of the gallbladder. Again, ensure to fan through the entire structure of interest to fully evaluate for abnormalities. Next, the gallbladder wall thickness is measured. Adjust the angle of the transducer to obtain a clear view of the gallbladder wall. Once clear wall margins are noted, a still image can be obtained. The gallbladder wall thickness is measured at the anterior wall, which is closest to the transducer. Note that in the field further from the gallbladder, posterior acoustic enhancement is noted. This may cause interference with the wall measurement posteriorly, and hence the anterior wall measurement is considered more accurate. A normal gallbladder should be thin-walled or less than 3 mm in width. Note that the measurement of gallbladder wall thickness is routinely done to evaluate for signs of inflammation, such as acute cholecystitis. The gallbladder wall may appear falsely thickened in patients with contracted gallbladders, such as non-fasting patients. Additionally, there are some other pathologic causes of increased wall thickness, as listed. The last step of the biliary ultrasound is likely the most difficult from a technical perspective and consists of finding the portal triad and measuring the common bile duct diameter. As briefly discussed earlier in this lecture, the best method is to first find the neck of the gallbladder. Next, find the main lobar fissure, which extends from the neck of the gallbladder and is easily seen on ultrasound as a bright, hyperechoic line. The main lobar fissure leads to the visualization of the portal vein and the common bile duct typically lies anterior to the portal vein. Here we see the gallbladder on the right side of the video clip. The neck of the gallbladder leads to the main lobar fissure leading to the main portal vein. Once the main portal vein is located entering the liver, the probe can be manipulated to visualize other parts of the portal triad. As shown in this still image, the common bile duct can be seen as a tiny tubular structure just anterior to the portal vein. In this particular image, the portal triad with the portal vein and CBD are demonstrated in their long axis. Regarding measurement of the common bile duct, Ensure to measure the intraluminal distance, or inner wall to inner wall, as shown on the video to the left. The ideal measurement is taken at the common bile duct's point of exit from the liver at the porta hepatis. This is accomplished via the technique described in the previous slides, using the main lobar fissure and the gallbladder as a guide to finding the portal vein and the CBD. The diameter of the CBD in younger patients under the age of 40 should typically be 4 mm or less. After the age of 40, the upper limit of normal increase is 1 mm for each decade. Also, note that patients that have had their gallbladder removed 
or patients with recent exploration of their biliary system, such as post-ERCP procedure, may have dilatation up to 10 millimeters. Please note that dilatation of the CBD suggests a blockage of biliary outflow. Here are some further images of the portal triad demonstrated in the long axis. Note the use of color flow Doppler to differentiate the portal vein and hepatic artery from the CBD. The CBD will not have evidence of detectable flow. In this example, the portal vein is seen in two different axes, as is the CBD. The image on the left demonstrates an oblique cross-section of the portal vein and a longitudinal view of the CBD as indicated by the caliper measurement. Meanwhile, the image on the right in the same patient demonstrates the view if the probe is rotated. The portal vein is seen in its short or transverse axis. The CBD is also noted in its short axis, anterior to the portal vein, within the portal triad. If the entire portal triad is visualized in its transverse or short axis, the result is a large circular portal vein with two adjacent circular structures being the hepatic artery and the common bile duct. This is commonly referred to as the Mickey Mouse sign. The large portal vein represents the character's face, while the hepatic artery and CBD represent the ears. Here is another example of the Mickey Mouse sign, which refers to the transverse cross-section of the portal triad. We will now discuss the sonographic evaluation of the spleen. The spleen is an intraperitoneal organ that is located in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. Structurally and functionally, the spleen's composition consists of red pulp and white pulp. The red pulp is responsible for removing old or defective red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets from the circulation. The white pulp is responsible for initiation of the immune response, resulting in the production of antibodies and lymphocytes. From an ultrasound perspective, the spleen, much like the liver, is a very vascular organ which also serves as a reservoir for blood. Hence, the spleen is typically easy to visualize an ultrasound once the correct probe placement is achieved. When attempting to locate the spleen, the sonographer should keep in mind that the spleen is oftentimes posterior and superior, or cephalad, compared to the liver which lies in the right upper quadrant. The normal spleen ranges from approximately 6 cm to 13 cm in length. Ideally, the patient should lie supine as the examiner places the probe in the left upper quadrant as shown. If necessary, the patient may also be turned to the right lateral position. The splenic parenchyma appears similar to that of the liver on ultrasound, described as a smooth homogeneous echo texture. The spleen, however, lacks the extensive network of vasculature and ducts contained within the liver. Additionally, the normal spleen appears slightly hyperechoic in comparison to the normal liver on ultrasound. To scan the spleen in its longitudinal axis, the probe is placed in the left upper quadrant at the mid-axillary line as shown. The probe marker is held facing cephalad, or towards the patient's axilla. Note that the long axis of the spleen is typically not in line with the long axis of the body. As a result, Slight rotation of the probe may be required to obtain a true long axis view. The long axis is measured from the inferolateral tip of the spleen, which lies over the left kidney, up to the superomedial portion of the spleen, which comes up to the left hemidiaphragm. Measure the long axis as illustrated. After obtaining the long axis view, rotate the probe 90 degrees to obtain a short axis view of the spleen. Once again, make sure to scan through the entire structure from superior pole to hilum to inferior pole to fully evaluate for abnormalities. We will conclude this lecture with some examples of commonly encountered pathology while performing liver, biliary, and spleen ultrasound. As discussed previously, this coronal view of the right lobe of the liver and the right kidney allows the examiner to evaluate Morrison's pouch, which is the most dependent region of the peritoneal cavity when a patient is lying supine. 
Recall that fluid appears anechoic on ultrasound. Therefore, this particular video clip demonstrates no fluid in Morrison's pouch. In contrast, here we see examples of free fluid in Morrison's pouch. Note that fluid can collect at the anterior aspect of the pouch or deep within the pouch as demonstrated on the right. Typically, ultrasound is able to detect as little as 200 milliliters of free fluid in the peritoneum. Note that all fluid appears black or anechoic on ultrasound. Hence, a patient's clinical presentation and history are necessary to determine if the free fluid is more likely to be ascites or blood. Here is an example of a gallstone. Gallstones appear as hyperechoic structures within the gallbladder, which cast a posterior acoustic shadow. In this video clip, a very large stone is present, occupying most of the gallbladder and casting a large shadow. Here is an example of lithogenic bile in the gallbladder, which has not fully formed into a gallstone as of yet. This is commonly referred to as gallbladder sludge, and it tends to layer out in a dependent fashion due to gravity. Sludge may or may not cast a shadow. However, an important point to remember is that sludge, similar to gallstones, can still result in biliary tree blockage or cholecystitis. Note the video clip which demonstrates a gallstone as well as sludge within the gallbladder. Shown here is an image of a gallbladder polyp. Note that the polyp does not cast a shadow as a gallstone would, and furthermore is not dependent, but rather attached to the anterior wall of the gallbladder in this case. Gallbladder polyps are a fairly common occurrence and may be confused for gallstones by an inexperienced sonographer. Finally, demonstrated here is a dilated common bile duct, suggesting that there is a blockage in the biliary system. Common causes of biliary blockage include intrinsic bile duct blockage from an impacted gallstone, extrinsic compression from a mass, and cholangitis, which is an inflammation of the bile ducts. There are many other causes of biliary obstruction as well. Note the CBD appears similar to the portal vein in that it is a fluid-filled structure that is tubular in shape and has hyperechoic walls. However, one can clearly see that the portal vein is just deeper to the dilated CBD. One way to confirm that the second tubular structure is a dilated common bile duct is to use color flow Doppler mode. In this video, we note two separate structures that are almost of equal diameter, which have hyperechoic walls and are fluid filled. Presumably, the structure indicated by the blue arrow is the portal vein and the structure indicated by the green arrow is a dilated common bile duct, which typically is much smaller in diameter compared to the portal vein. Here, in color flow Doppler mode, we can confirm that the structure in the nearer field does not demonstrate flow and therefore is indicative of a dilated CBD. Thank you for your participation. This concludes our abdominal ultrasound part one lecture.